And welcome everyone to the Off Limits Podcast, Season 2, Episode 1, as promised. Much anticipated episode. Much anticipated if you follow us. It's been on our podcast for like four four or five episodes now. We have a, a great, let's say a great Jim. friend to the Barrera family. Great friend, great man of God. My favorite president of the assembly. Sorry, Brother Marty, or Pastor Marty now, but my favorite president <laughs> yeah. of the Apostolic Assembly. We have a bishop president. Philip Salazar. Good to have you, sir. It's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Amen. Yeah, we're going to start off with a little bit of the backstory. Um, of sorry how, for of how our family knows you. Um, yeah. And for those of you who don't know, uh, the Barrera family uh, has always congregated at their Church of Hosanna. That's right. And they most of them. Most, most of them. them. We're still From trying to get to, to the time. rest. Still trying to get the rest. Just a little exhortation to the Barrera family. <laughs> yeah, sometimes they come and they go. They're like, that's right. They get sheep. They get a little lost, but a good shepherd. That's right. Come to church. Always come to, come to get them. Matter of fact, one pressing question from one Barrera in particular. Uh, they wanted to ask, who is your favorite Barrera? Barrera. That you, that's not a safe question to ask. <laughs> I'm not going to answer it. That's the way I was going. The wise man right there. He knows. He knows. That's why I'm the pastor of the Barreras. <laughs> exactly. Yes, yeah, so we want to get a little bit to know about your backstory. What's your early childhood like for Bishop Salazar? What does that look like? Well, I mean, the earliest memory, you mean? Like something like that? Well, like, how did you start? Because I, I, when I was when, a little kid. Correct, yeah. yeah. Like, when I was talking about that. Our family, you're talking about our family? Well, um, our family comes from um, my dad from. Durango, my mom from Sinaloa, and um, lived, my family lived in Tijuana. My dad and mom were married there. I think it was in Tijuana. And my sister was born there. My brother and I were born in San Diego, National City. So as soon as they crossed over the, the uh, border and became, you know, uh, uh, residents of the United States, we, um, my brother and I and all the rest of us were born here in the States. Um, we lived in the Chula Vista area for a while, and then we moved to San, to Arizona. My dad stayed there for about a year or so, pastored the church up there. Then uh, after that, we moved down to, I believe it was here in Compton. And we stayed here for a bit, congregating the Church of Watts. Uh, when the church at Watts and the church of uh, Compton united, I think that was like in the 60s, mid-60s, we moved to San Pedro, and then from San Pedro, we moved to Long Beach, and been in Long Beach ever since, you know, elementary school, the whole deal. So, my dad was a carpenter, my mom a homemaker. That's pretty much it. Um, my dad didn't always work at the uh, at, at carpentry. He did that mostly in, in Mexico. When he came down here, he work work on it from time to time, kind of like a side job. And he worked like at refineries and stuff like that, wherever he could, he could find work. And so that went on for for um, years until I remember that my dad cut off one of the tips of his finger while I was working. I think it was for Texaco refinery, and he got some money. And so that was a down for, for us to buy a house in Long Beach, and we bought a home there, and that gave our family a lot of stability because then that were really low income. We were, um, you know. Bunch of kids, six kids, living in you know apartments with two bedrooms. Just, just uh, it was a challenging time for our family. So that purchase of that home really stabilized our our, our whole family. And um, and then from there it was we. My dad tried to start a church in San Peter. In fact, he did. Didn't work out. And we congregated in Wilmington from that time until. Our juniors, we were, we were in the juniors department, when the youth there, and that was our church. That's where we got discipled and we grew up. Um, Sunday school, came deacon there. Um, you know, began to develop my gifts as a teacher there. And, uh, and then uh, in the 80s, I think it was like 82, 83, around there, we moved to Compton and we were in Compton for the rest of the time until we, I was sent out to San Pedro. So it's been kind of a long trajectory there, but most of our, of our uh, infancy was spent uh, here in the Los Angeles area, you know, Long Beach, 
mostly here. That's something I didn't know when I was talking to my dad about your background was, I didn't know your dad was a pastor. Yeah, yeah, yeah he, was, um, he was the first national missionary for Mexican, for our Mexican assembly or church, rather not the assembly, but the church to Oaxaca. Wow. And, um, and uh, he did that for a time, then he came back, and then he pastored a couple of churches. He founded, I think it was the fourth or the eighth church of San Tijuana. I don't know which one of the two it was, one of those two churches. And, uh, and then before they came over to the United States. In the United States, he pastored a church in Superior, Arizona. I think he pastored in San Pedro for a little while and then pastored in Culver City when he passed away. Oh, he was a pastor. And growing up, especially in our generation, we hear the term a lot of PK. I don't know if you had that type of, um, I guess you would say, yeah. dialogue back then about what, it, what was that like for you to grow up as a pastor's kid? Good. I, I, I've i never been, viewed ministry as a bad thing. I've never viewed growing up in a ministerial family as a negative. It's always been a positive. For us as kids, it wasn't like, our parents never talked about church, never bet negative stuff about the church, always positive things. So it was a positive environment we grew up in. I know that some kids have ex been exposed to you know, families where the, the talk about the church or talk about the brothers or whatever was negative, and that always affects the kids very negatively. Yeah. It, it wounds them, and it's not the circumstance that's wounding them, it's the parents that wound kids. And so, and so that never went on. I can't think of one conversation that took place in our, in our home where the brothers were talked about negatively or the church was talked about negatively. It was always positive talk. So, or no talk about the church at all in front of the kids. So for me, it was always a positive experience. I think being a PK is one of the best things in the world that could happen to you. Uh, you're born with, um, and you grow up in an environment uh, sometimes of need, no question about it, but that's probably not due to the fact that you're a minister's son. Mm -hmm. It's probably due, due more to the fact of your education, level of education and struggles you would have probably gone through as, as, um, as a financially as, a, as a, just a regular member growing up in the church. You know, people struggle. But being in a, in a ministerial family is an advantage. I've always viewed it that way, not a deficit. Yeah, big time. Yeah, I think you framed it very well when you said that. Yeah. Yeah. It goes with how it's spoken about. I think that's definitely, definitely something that... Well, it's like parents are huge, advan huge advantage or disadvantage for kids. And that's always true. It doesn't matter if you're in or out of the church, if you're, if you're in the ministry or out of the ministry. It doesn't matter. Uh, the biggest influences on kids are going to be the parents. And if you got Christian parents that are solid, that love the Lord, that love the church, you're going to do well. You know, that, that was our experience, always. Awesome. You said you started your ministry. You said how old were you? What was your ministerial beginning? Well, I mean, it depends on, like, uh, um, a ministry is, you're talking about ordained Correct. ministry, ordained right? Ministry. Okay. I started, I was uh, set aside as a deacon in... Um, hmm. 1980, I think it was, and then I was uh, was a deacon for four years, and got uh, ordained to the ministry at the 1984, and I was I got set aside to the ministry in the Church of Wilmington and got ordained here in the Church of Compton, okay. and Brother uh, Martin Calderon was my pastor, so he's the one that uh, that actually you know uh, told me we're gonna we're gonna ordain you now. I wanted to wait more time. I, I wasn't in any hurry to get to become a minister. It didn't matter to me that much whether, you know, I was sitting in the platform with the ministers or not. Um, ministry is about serving. It's not about titles. Uh, but he insisted. He says, "No, no, you're going to do it now." And so I did. I obeyed my pastor. Yeah. Awesome. What school did you go? To? Did you go to ABI or what school did you? I went go to, to Apostolic Bible Institute. Yeah, St. Paul, Minnesota. I went for a year. I didn't want to go more than a year. I could have gone back, I suppose, but, but uh, no, it wasn't in the cards for me. Why did you want to go only one year? Well, I felt like I should dedicate at least one year of my education to the Lord. Hmm. And, and that I did, uh, that I had as a goal since I was baptized. And, um, and, but the other reality was that, you know, there's my mom there, and my dad died when we were 16 years old. And so, you know, all of us kids would pitch in to help my mom financially, you know to keep the house afloat. There's five kids at home and, 
and um, and uh, you know, you got everybody wants to eat, and you need a place to stay, you got to pay the mortgage, and uh, so we all just did whatever we could to help my mom survive. And uh, pitching a little bit here, a little bit there. Everyone, you know, that was working would help out. And that's, that's, that's the reason that we did it. My mom uh, was an amazing woman. And uh, we did the best we could to support her. Are you a proponent of any particular school now? Because I know Urshan is getting a lot of popularity because of the UPCI. Yeah. And Bishop Bernard. Yeah. And his work. Yeah. I mean, it depends what you want to do, I suppose. Um, but no, I, 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 as far as all of the United Pentecostal Colleges or the Apostolic Assembly College or whatever, it, 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 I, I don't think that there's, well, I shouldn't say that. I, I haven't researched enough to know which ones are better than others. Mm -hmm. I do know that where I chose to go, Apostolic Bible Institute was a great college. And um, uh, at least uh, 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 Brother Norris was there, Brother Saban was there, Brother Gillespie at that time was, was good. He's not good anymore, but, but um, those men were fantastic teachers and they did a great job for us. And uh, we're, we're, we were, um, you know, I was, I was privileged to go there. Urshan Bible College, I've heard a lot of good things about that. It's, an, it's, it's, it's a great college. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the point I guess is if you want to go to Bible college, go to Bible college, choose the best one you can. Wherever you land, just give it everything. You're going to do great. That's my opinion. So, I mean, I don't know other than, than to tell you if you're feeling that call and it's not for everyone, then go to Bible college. And wherever you land, take full advantage of it. That's really the key because you can land at a great Bible college and do mediocre work and be a mediocre student and not take, you know, a full advantage of absolutely everything you could have or, 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 or grow or learn as much as you could have. You can just make it through, you know. So I guess it all kind of depends on your drive, your desire, what you want to accomplish when you go there, and just give it everything if you're going to go. You know. And at what point did you meet Sister Rose? Well, I met Sister Rose when she was young. What's that love story like? Who captured she, Bishop President's heart? Well, <laughs> she, it didn't start off as a love story initially. <laughs> Sister Rose was 14 years old and I was 19 years old when I first met her. Um, but uh, when we started getting interested in each other, she was, uh, I think she was 19 and I was 24. I think that's when it was. And then we dated for a year and then we uh, got were engaged for a year. Then we were married after that two years. But um, yeah, I, I remember that, that when I did get interested in her, I started to, um, I was a national Bible quiz coordinator at the time and she was, I think the coordinator for the sect or something like that. <laughs> and, um, and so I was interested. So I took advantage of my position as a <laughs> National Bible Quiz coordinator to call her. So Sister Rose, how are you doing on Bible quiz in your sector and your local church? And she would tell me, I'm doing good, I'm doing good, you know, everything's going fine. And then I'd call her again because I liked her, you know, I, just, I was interested. And after a while she started saying, but why are you calling me so much? You know, <laughs> what's going on with you? And, uh, <laughs> Ay, ay, ay. And, uh, and so I did, you know, we, she, she, I said, no, no, I'm just calling, you know, just to see how you're doing and how Bible quiz is going. She wouldn't let me get away with it. Yeah. So she kind of, she kind of pressed me a little bit. I said, look, we'll talk about this when we get to convention. And when we got to the National Youth Convention that year, I think it was here in, in Anaheim, I told her what my intention was. And I told her, look, I'm looking for a girlfriend. I says, I intend to get married. So I'm not here just to have a little girlfriend and go another one or whatever. Never had an official girlfriend. And uh, I, I'm asking you to be my girlfriend with the view towards marriage, because in my mind, marriage is a very sacred thing and dating is a sacred thing. You don't just date people to have fun and to go out and enjoy yourself. If you're gonna ask a girl to be a girlfriend, you're upping the, the ante to the next level. She's not just one of the girls, she's your girl. Mm -hmm. And then after that, if things work out and you get to know her pretty well and you like what you're getting to know and she likes you, then you up the ante and you get engaged. And once it, and it just, it's just a growing level of commitments is what it is. So from the very beginning, I had very clear what my objective was with any girl that I was gonna officially begin to date. And that was Sister Rose in this case. So for me, it was, okay, Sister Rose. And I told her for the first time I talked to her, 
about this person a person and I ask her to be my girlfriend. I said, my goal is to marry you. It may not work out, but that's my goal. And um, I'm not here playing around. So she accepted and, uh, you know, two years later we're getting married. How did she take it when you initially like set that proposition that way? Mm. That have you seen a picture of me when I was young? No. She took it real good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. She took it well. It could be true. No. <laughs> good. She took it well. And where do you think that mindset adopted from? Was it something your father had taught you, or do you think it's reflected biblically to take the levels of relationship, like they compound the Well, I was 24 years old, you know. Which I was still young. But nowadays, it's like real young. Yes, I was going to yeah. say. But in that day, the train's changed. already passing you by, you know. Not that my train was passing me by, but, but I was already, you know, 24 years old. I wanted to get married. And I didn't think I, at the church that I grew up in, they taught us that, that you don't just date anyone. We believe in courting. Dating is with the view of marriage. That's the only reason for you to tell a girl, I want you to be my girlfriend, is that you're actually looking, okay, I'm ready to get married now. And I'm seriously looking, and you are potentially someone that I would think about being my, my wife. Other than that, just be friends. Just hang out. Just go have some coffee with everyone. Don't make a girl or a guy feel like they're special if you're not ready to make that commitment. That was my way of thinking, and that's the way that I thought since, you know, that's the way I was brought up in Wilmington, you know. If you had a girlfriend in Wilmington, okay, something really serious was going on. Mm -hmm. When you were deciding whether to court Sister Rose, did uh, your ministry come into play as far as like uh, letting her know like I'm pursuing ministry is something very important to me and like she had to be on board with before committing to yeah. that relationship? No, I don't think that I totally had that down. I knew she was a really good girl. I knew she was involved in church ministry, local church ministry. I knew she loved the Lord. Um, if that hadn't been true, I wouldn't have dated her. Yeah. For me, dating a girl is not about, oh my God, she's so gorgeous or... I, I really, I really, you know, like her. It isn't all about emotions. It's about making a, a, a good, concrete Christian decision about the person that, that potentially you're going to live with for the rest of your life, that you're going to be with in the best and in the worst times. And so you don't make an emotional decision only on that. You sit down and you think about it. So yeah, you know, Rose was a wonderful young lady. She was involved in youth ministry. She was involved in local church. She was submissive to her parents. She was submissive to her pastor. She had everyone that I talked to, she had a good testimony and everybody liked Rose. And I know she had a good solid family. I mean, by that I mean that she was, she was in a good relationship with her dad and her mom. I don't need anything more. That's great starting material. Now, whether we were looking at the same direction ministerially or anything else, that was going to come later on down the road. That's what dating's about. We talk about ministry, what her plans were, what my plans were. We didn't talk about anything more personal than that. It's not appropriate for the commit level of commitment, but we would talk about those things. And then I figured out, oh, yeah, this girl's interested in ministry. Didn't come from a ministerial family. Her dad was first generation apostolic. Her mom's first generation apostolic. She's second generation I'm also second generation. So it wasn't about anything else and then she's solid. She's just, she's the kind of a girl that if you marry, you know it's gonna make for a great ministerial future because she's got the same kind of mindset that I do about serving God. And so that's all that was necessary. The rest of it, or that knowledge rather, be became solidified as we begin to date. But I already had a hint of that, a pretty strong hint of that because I saw her in church and how she acted in church and how she was involved, and how she interacted with the young people, and all of those things are tremendous indication about the kind of a life uh, partner or wife that you're gonna get. I, I didn't have to guess at that very much. She was a great girl, and, um, and so the, everything was there. I mean, if, you, if you're gonna get engaged or start dating someone that you're gonna, yeah, I know, yeah, I know they're not everything they should be, I'm gonna kinda fix them up. Okay, get ready for trouble. And if you're that kind of person, you better fix yourself up so that you're the right kind of a guy for the gal. So I, I didn't take a gamble on that. I, if I'd have known that Rose was, um, was worldly in a way of thinking, if I'd have known that Rose was, um, was a, not a solid Christian, if, I, if I'd got a hint that she was rebellious towards her parents while we were dating, that'd have been the end of it. So when, did you know Sister Rose <clears throat> would be the one, or you just went into the relationship? expecting or believing that she could be from or from the beginning yes, yes from the beginning yeah no i think that at the beginning the only reason that i started dating her is because i thought she'd she'd be the one 
why else would I date her, right? I could have her as my friend. I could talk to her. I could hang out. I could, you know, see her at sector services, district services, if she's just going to be like a friend. But the reason I'm going to engage in a relationship with her, which is, it's boyfriend, girlfriend. It's not that serious Correct. when you think, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, engagement, and then marriage, which is it. All the doors are closed. You know, you're, you're in the relationship. But, but in terms of, okay, in, in all around me, there are hundreds of good, wonderful young ladies. And then I'm going to tell her, you're special. I want to date you. Yeah, I had a pretty good idea that she was one. Correct, because I feel the current mindset for a lot of people, well, speaking, I guess, for myself, when I was growing up, I was kind of under the same mindset with my parents. Mm -hmm. You date with the intention to marry. No. And then I went to a Christian school, but it was a Trinitarian-founded one. And the, the idiom at the time was get a ring by spring. So you, get, you would start mm -hmm. campus, start school, and then you get married within six months or propose within six months. Yeah. But the professors cautioned that that made dating that relationship put a lot of pressure on the individual or the young woman on that relationship because you're entering that mindset or that relationship with the intention to marry. That's Whereas, foolish. You know, that, that's that's foolish I because why else would you enter a relationship with a young lady if your intention is not to marry her? Because they, pre they position that you want to get to know them first before having any expectations but the, with them. And I think there's truth to that. I think that the way you get to, hang, you, you get to know her is you hang out with friends. Okay, so you, you hang out in dating. the group. And of course, I mean, for us, it's like if they come to the local church, you get to know them in the local church, you hang out, you see how she talks, you make no commitment to her and, uh, or to him or whatever, you're just hanging out. And uh, it's going to stand out. You're going to see her, how she helps people, how she loves people, how she prays at the altar with individuals, how she's ministry-oriented. You're going to see all of that. And so you're getting to know her. This idea that you have to be in a formal relationship to really know her is not accurate. You get to know the person, like I told you. Before I dated Rose, and it was the best decision I made in my life after, after getting baptized as who I married, and I married a great woman. Um, but you're already knowing her before, as I said, in all of the other informal interactions that we're having as young people. And Rose didn't congregate at the church that I congregated in. Ours was a little bit more of a long distance relation, but I still knew who she was, pretty much. And so, you get to know the individual, you think, okay, this person is a great person. She loves the Lord. She's a Christian. The fundamentals are there. And so then from there you say, and I like her, and I think she's cute. And you know what? I think I could really make a life with her. It isn't just the logical side of your brain. It's also the emotional attachment to getting to that one young lady. But once that's there, then yeah, you enter into the formal dating relationship with the mind of that I'm going to get married. And and again, here's the way that I put it. In their dating relationship, all of the doors are open to walk out of the relationship. And if I'm in a relationship with a girl and I break up with her, no one's going to say, oh my God, did, did you hear that Philip broke up with so-and-so? People don't care. They're going to say, oh, he did? Oh, well, whatever, you know, that's it, it's done. It gets a little bit more serious when you're engaged. When you're engaged, okay, you can still walk out of the relationship, but if you, you're engaged and then you back out of the relationship, you're like, oh my God, are you, are you kidding, really? They broke up? It's a little bit more, more, more dramatic or just whatever. And then when you get into marriage and all of the doors are closed, you can't get out of the marriage relationship. You walk into that with God's blessing, you stay in that relationship. And so all of the doors are closed. That's it, for better or for worse, for richer, for poor, whatever. The relationship has now been settled. You will live together for the rest of your life. And so the way that I see the relationship, the dating relationship, is that make the commitment with the view to that. Now, if something comes up that says, no, 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 no. For example, if I were to have dated Rose and then I found out that she listened to worldly music, this is my convictions, right? She listened to worldly music. And then I found out later on that she was, spoke bad about her parents. I would have ended the relationship because that's a no, 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 no. That's a problem that I need to take care of right away. And so, because I'm not in that relationship to fix people. I'm in that relationship because I've already kind of, from everyone, I'm getting all these testimonies. And, um, and I know that she's going to be a great wife. And now, would, let's assume that she listened to worldly music and I was to sit down to talk to her. And she said, you know what? It wasn't me, it's, you know, I don't listen to that, or it's no big deal. Fine, I'll stop listening to Western music or whatever. Not ever going to happen again. I'm going to respect your convictions. 
And in fact, they'll become mine. I mean, we'll work it out. We'll move forward. But you, when you begin the dating relationship, it's always with a view to marrying. It's not just courting. Because you can get to know a girl in the dating relationship just as well as you can get to know a girl just having her be one of your close friends. Um, although, I mean, something does change when you start dating a girl officially, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, and, but I think that, I don't care who it is, whether it's an authority or not an authority that says, that I'm a little bit black and white about this, that says, test the waters, test it out, and don't be looking to marry, just see if she's okay. No. I think you can do that without breaking the girl's heart or without having her break your heart. And that's just be friends and check it out. You know, check her out, see how she is and all the stuff that we've talked about. If everything checks and she's good, go for it, brother. Now, I'm not recommending to people, this is becoming like a marriage counseling therapy. What's kind of right? a breakdown of that? Yeah, I'm not recommending to people that when they sit down with their girlfriend the first day, that they tell her, I want to marry you potentially. Okay, that's not smart. Maybe it's not dumb, but it's not smart. It's probably not the best way to do it, but it's the way I did it, and it worked out great for me. Because well, I think it's a dating podcast now, but I think it's a lot of things that's important for the generation. Yeah. Like you were saying, a lot of people are getting older. I remember when I was uh, engaged to my wife, we are like, you're old already. It's time to get married. And I'm like, eh, I'm 26. I'm not too old. How old were you when you got married? I was 26, 27. Yeah, I was 26. You're younger than you. Yeah. My dad got married at 21, 19, 21. And like, so the, tr the age, I guess, of, the, of marriage continually pushes forward or back. Yeah. And everyone's confounded with the same statistic that 50% of marriages and end in divorce. divorce. And it sounds like you're a big proponent of education. Do you think education should be a, a criteria or something to keep an eye out? Strong values. Strong values. I don't know about education because there's a lot of holes, really smart people that are getting divorced all the time. That's true. And, um, but I know what you're referring to is more mm -hmm. Christian education, right? I think it's about values. You can have a lot of Bible knowledge, or at least you think you have a lot of Bible knowledge or have Bible knowledge and not have strong values. I think you have to have strong values. In other words, yeah. you've got to have, you have a firm commitment to what, you're, what, what you feel the Bible is talking to you about. So that if you, you can know all of the theology about marriage and, 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 and divorce and, and uh, a lot of head knowledge, and then you get into a relationship that's very turbulent or that's troublesome. And it's always because one or both of the people are not following Christian values. They're not subjecting themselves to it. That's usually the trouble, although I, I guess I couldn't speak black and white. There might be some trauma there, whatever. But it's usually that. Jesus says the reason your divorce is, uh, Moses allowed a writing to divorce is because of the hardness of your hearts. There's something in you or in you, one or both of the people that's hardening their hearts, it's causing them to go to divorce court. And so um, I, I, in my mind, um, a, a, a firm a, a commitment to what Jesus has said about life, about growing yourself, but having strong Christian values is what's really going to make a difference. Not just a lot of head knowledge or even Bible knowledge. You know, a lot of people have Bible knowledge and they still end up in divorce court. Yeah. So you have to know what your values are and you have to try to live your life by your values. When Rose and I, before we got married, we said, you know, uh, marriage is not perfect. We're not going to be happy all the time with each other. In fact, there will be times that they're challenging, um, but we will never talk about divorce. We'll never even mention the word divorce. We, we can live together for the rest of our lives miserably, but we will never talk about divorce. And uh, like my, um, my uh, Sunday school teacher, Brother Ralph Carrillo, before I got <coughs> married, took me to his house and he gave me some advice. I remember he told me this. I don't know anything else he told me. He told me this. He says, marriage can be heaven or it can be hell. It's going to be both for you, Phil. I said, so you're going to have to learn how to manage both, the heaven and the hell of marriage. It's really good when it's really good. And when it's bad, it can get really bad. And you have to manage both so that what's going to get you through the difficult times are going to be the values that you have, that God says marriage is for life, that your greatest potential for happiness is next to this woman or next to this man. You make a goal of it. You give it your best. And that's how you make a marriage work. So it's about, it's about education has a lot to do with it because you have to know what God says about it. But it's the values that are going to put those things to work and to function in your marriage that are going to take you the long haul. And, uh, you know, Rose and I have been married now for 38 years. And there have been great, great, great times. Our marriage is really solid and it's good. It's a great marriage. 
But we've had difficult days and we've had great days. And we've had days when we're all happy and days when we're not very happy. It's just what marriage is. I don't know that there's anything such thing as, um, as this perfect marriage. I just know that there are godly marriages and that there are ungodly marriages. And godly marriages aren't marriages that are exempt from all the troubles that there are in marriage. What it takes you out of a lot of the junk that happens in marriage, but it doesn't, it doesn't exempt you from the ups and the downs, but it does give you a, a, um, a solid core that is going to go right through the highs and the lows of marriage so that you're safe, stable and solid. It doesn't matter what the devil throws at you. Awesome. So now you're engaged, you get married. What's the, the mindset to have kids? What does that look like for you and Sister Rose? Because nowadays the we just had kids. The eight, like, so that's there was no planning. We just had open, kids. Just that happened. We just had kids. Because now the, like, there's no family planning going on here. Isn't <laughs> that God said a man and a woman will have children, and we're a man and woman, and we had children. That was it. And um, the next question would be, what was it like, or not to speak for your children, but what was the like for you think, for you as a father and a minister or a pastor? At what point did you have children in your ministry? Were you a minister? You were already yeah, I was ordained. a minister. I was a minister here in Compton. Mm -hmm. I, uh, uh, all of my uh, our, our three children were dedicated here in Compton to the Lord. So they were all born here and, and not raised here because Katie, we presented here a, a Sunday before we went to San Pedro Church, the pastor over there. But yeah, I mean, uh, our children were... were um, were, I mean, one of the biggest blessings that God's given our family, right? And now, you know, years after having had our kids, they're all serving the Lord, they all love God, they're all involved in ministry. It is one of the fountains, the greatest fountain, the deepest fountains of satisfaction for my wife and I. You know? Are there any tips you can give to parents that are involved in church, serving in ministry, yeah. when it comes to raising yeah. children. children to stay, in yeah. to stay Li within the church? Live what you want your kids to live. And understand that your kids will always challenge. Wherever you set the standard, that's where the challenge is going to be. Keep it as high as you can. The standard for how you're going to live. Two, be involved in ministry 100%. And your children will learn to love the church, learn to love ministry. Number three, don't ever talk bad about the church. Always talk good about the church. Talk good about the brothers. Be an apostolic if you're going to be an apostolic. Don't, don't be one of those people that, that thinks that you can criticize the church and, and over here, it's not going to affect your children that are listening to you. They'll do what you, they'll, they'll start pushing against you wherever you set the standard as high or as low as you do. And so you got to be real with your kids, you know, and love the Lord and love God's people and love the church. And um, that's what I would tell them to do um, for their spiritual life, you know. Yeah. I think that's, you're setting your kids up in a great place if you do that, you know. Yeah, I think that's a great point, the setting the standards high yeah. and keeping them there. Because yeah. I think it's, at least from what I've seen, I think the standards have continued to degrade or to be lowered in order to try to retain Their a kids. portion of yeah. the church. Right. Well, your dad done that for you guys regarding service. Yes, correct. And your mom, no se diga, you know, yeah. they're great people. The reason you guys are here serving the Lord is because your dad and your mom have set a high standard for you guys as far as service is concerned. Yes. And so... The impact of a parent on their children is gargantuan, for good or for bad. And so I, I, I don't, I, Rose and I have always envisioned our children serving the Lord, our children always being involved in the Lord, and they've had their struggles, their, their moments where they've had to work things out on their own so that this faith isn't just their parents' faith, it's their faith, so that their love for God isn't their parents' love or because they're expected to do that or because they're ministry children or nothing like that. It's because they love the Lord. And, and how that happens so that children catch the reality, the, the genuineness of the Christian faith. I think there's no other way of doing that other than these people that are going to be the greatest influence on the lives of their children live what they teach and say they believe. When you do that, that's caught. You can teach yourself and should teach yourself Christian doctrine and the beliefs and everything else about the church. And we're apostolic. We believe in one God. We believe in this. We believe in that. These are doctrines. That's just a part of it. They don't, they're not going to catch that. They're going to understand that. What they're going to catch is how to really live for God and how to love God with all of their hearts and how to choose the Lord, not just 
by confession, but by a commitment that you have, uh, that you have for your life. You know, you've surrendered to him. They catch that. They hear the teachings and they catch the way that you're living for God. And so how much commitment and how blessed you want your children to be regarding all that's concerned, it's, it's totally up to you. It's the way you live your life, I think, more than anything else. It's, they catch the lifestyle, they hear and understand the lessons. So. Awesome. So uh, you're a pastor now for how long? You said you're married for 38 years. How long have you been? Jeez, I, I, I don't even remember the date. I was in the 90s some time 95 or 99 i don't know something like that it came and you've always been pastored 30, here. 30 years ago you you do the math i'm not that good at math <laughs> 93? no i'm 30 years ago that's 93 that's my yeah. 93 that's when i began to pastor yeah, san pedro okay. san that was the first church and, yeah san pedro church yep that was that was all the school five years of learning pobrecito los hermanos you know <laughs> but it was five years of just learning how to deal with people and how to lead people and how to grow up as a leader and um it was a great experience. St. Peter Church was a great church. So when you started your ministry, you said you were like 14, when you started teaching and learning more about? No, I got baptized at the age of 16, so maybe about 17, 18, I started teaching, started teaching juniors, you know, crazy juniors, and, uh, and uh, then young people, and then I got to teach the adults. I was developing my teaching ministry, which is something that I, I learned to love from the time that I was newly baptized because of my Sunday school teacher. So for every Sunday school teacher or cell group leader or, or any, whatever level of teaching you're doing, teaching children, teaching juniors, you can never underestimate the impact that you're going to have with those young kids. Because perhaps the one teacher that had the greatest influence over my life, all of the men, the great men that I've known and hung around with, the person that most impacted my life was Ralph Carrillo. Nobody knows who Ralph Carrillo is. I know who he is because he te taught me to love the Word of God when I was 16 years old. So as a and 16, that love's never gone away. As a 16-year-old getting baptized, did you ever envision yourself becoming president okay. of the organization? I didn't envision myself you... becoming president when I went to the, <clears throat> to the, to the uh, when I first got, uh, uh, not ever, let me just say it that way, not ever, and the only time that I had a hint that I might be president was this last November, prior to that when I was going to convention because it was only obvious that I might become. Other than that, when I got on the general board, I had no clue at all that I was just there just to do my job as a bishop. I had no clue, nor aspiration, no desire to become president at all. It just happened. And I was more shocked than anybody else in that convention. And since then, I mean, it becomes a greater possibility that you're going to continue on the board or whatever. Uh, but it's been, it's been a shock to me every time, just about. Why were you shocked? Because I don't, I don't, well, I've never coveted those positions. I, I, God knows that's the truth. Just God knows it. Not, not, not pastor, not bishop, not minister, not board member, not president, not anything. I don't, I've never coveted those decisions. If I am, the only thing I really wanted to be as far as ministerially is a pastor. That's all I ever really wanted to be. And I wasn't going to push my way into being one. I, I was asked to be a pastor. And I accepted the challenge with my wife. But um, when I became bishop, I had no clue I was going to be the bishop until I got to the convention. And I started saying, hey, we're going to, you know, we want you to be our bishop, the pastor. A couple of pastors told me, that. Thought, oh, my goodness, what's going on here? I had no clue. And so, no, I've never desired it. Well, when I get there, I try to do the best job I can, and um, but that's about it. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I don't. Um, I didn't. I didn't come into the faith thinking someday I'm going to lead this organization. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. Yeah. What would or what would a successful presidency be for you when you leave, whenever that may be? That the church is focused on its mission. And that the church is organizing around its mission, which is evangelism, discipleship. That, that, that is the marker of the success, that the apostolic assembly is growing okay. in a healthy manner. When I leave the presidency, I want to I be able to, when I die, and God says, look, I made you the leader of this entire denomination. I want to be able to tell him, look, I try to organize this whole church to the best of my ability, so it'd be totally focused on the mission. 
And if I messed up doing that, you have to, you have to forgive me. But that's what I want to be able to tell the Lord. All of my efforts were geared at, because I'm going to have to give God an account someday for what he's given me here. I don't feel, I, I mean, I feel it's a privilege to be the president, but I don't feel like, oh my God, I've really like reached the top of what it means to be a member of the apostolic assembly. I am the leader of all the leaders. You know, forget all of that stuff. You know, get all that to one side. And here's what I'm thinking. Someday I'm going to have to stand before God for this. And I don't want to have to stand before God and say, what did you do? Well, I had conventions and we had services and we had seminars and conferences and it was really good. I think the brothers had a really great time. I think that's going to totally unsatisfy God because he'll tell me, what about the mission? What about evangelism? What about reaching the world? What about the churches organizing to reach their communities? And if I don't have a good answer for that, then okay, kill me before I become president. So are there any things that you have in mind that you would want to change instantly if you could within the church without having to No, I don't even, I don't even, have, I don't even have those illusions because you cannot change anything instantly. Not Correct. an organization yeah. this big. And, and there are no such thing as magic wands. Um, and uh, I mean, I've been in this church long enough, which doesn't, doesn't have to be that long to know that significant things change with significant time. Correct. One of the questions we had on our podcast that everyone, someone wanted to know is, could you elaborate on the difference between an op- apostolic standard of the assembly versus apostolic, apostolic doctrine? doctrine. Then there's 19- yeah, no, it's simple. Apostolic doctrine has to do with what the Bible teaches specifically. Apostolic standards have to do with how we apply biblical principles. They're clearly taught in the scripture the principles. For example, <clears throat> the... the uh, um, the principle of modesty. But that's a biblical principle. You don't argue with that. No one in the church can say, well, I choose not to be modest because modesty is not an option for us. It just simply is the biblical standard. How you interpret that then does, that's where, where, where culture affects and, and, uh, and, and personal convictions come into play. And, and all of those kinds of things. So one of them is clear biblical teaching, that's biblical doctrine, and the other are principles, convictions, are, are, are standards that we set to safeguard either the modesty of the church or the holiness of the church that are born or spring from biblical principles or doctrine. So modesty is a doctrine, it's a teaching of the church, and convictions uh, that spring from that solid doctrine so that what is modesty here in the United States of America isn't necessarily what's going to be modesty in, in India. Hmm. They might be just a little bit different in, as far as the kind of dress that people use and all that, the, uh, you know, attire that they wear and things of that nature. But whether it's over there or over here, modesty is a standard. We don't, we don't, we don't question modesty. So that's the difference. One is biblical, black and white, there the Bible says it, there's the words, here's what it says. And the other is not that specifically uh, uh, detailed in scripture. But that's what the church is there for. And every denomination from denomination to denomination will establish standards, like corporations establish standards for their businesses, for what their business attire is going to be, whether relaxed and it doesn't matter, you know, come whichever way you want to come dress, or whether you will come in this uniform, or whether you will come in this formal or semi-formal attire, whatever the corporation establishes, that's what they're doing. In the church, I think that the leadership also has a, 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 a something to say about where the standard is going to be drawn. I remember years ago talking to a, a pastor friend of mine and um, about precisely that, the standards of the church. And um, he was talking to me about the, the, uh, the women wearing pants. And of course, our church has a standard against women wearing pants because we feel it's masculine attire. And so he, and I went to Deuteronomy 22.5. Obviously, that's, that's a text. And then he says, well, Deuteronomy 22 doesn't only talk about um, women, uh, you know, wearing men's clothing and men wearing women's clothing, but also talks about mixing linens and it talks about these other things. He said, do, are we going to take a standard then against polyester and or or the mixing of our, is that also going to be a sin or is that Old Testament doesn't matter anymore? And if that doesn't matter, then this doesn't matter. 
And I really didn't know what good answer to give him. But what I should have told him is this. What you're telling me then is that this scripture that is speaking against transvestitism is obsolete. And now the church, because we don't have another scripture over here in the New Testament, now the church says that transvestitism is okay. You can dress like women or men. That's cool because it's just an Old Testament scripture that's put with these other ones. So now transvestitism is okay. He would have absolutely backed down and said, no, no, of course not. But that exactly is what that scripture is talking about, whether it's in the New Testament or the Old Testament. And so, it's this, and so what he did was, for his church, he set a lower standard. And he wouldn't tell the ladies who couldn't wear pants, and, and the whole standards thing, he, was, he went the liberal way, right? And I said, I said, brother, I said, someday you're going to have to set a standard for your church because that's what the leadership does. And sure enough, time went on in his church, and he, he told me later on, that the ladies started coming in with their tight pants and then with low-cut blouses, and that's when he had to set the standard. No, no, no sleeves and low-cut. And he, he said, when I saw that, I just said, wait, wait, something is wrong. And, and then he called everybody together. He said, no, this is the standard. You can wear pants and you can do this, but you can't do this and you can't do the other. And it was right. He had to set a standard because everybody has to set a standard. Right? And so convictions are that that um, that area where the church leaders are coming and saying, okay, guys, here's how we're going to apply this. Here's the principle. Leaders say, here's how we apply it. The principle and the doctrine is biblical. The application isn't specified in Scripture because the Bible and God is wise. He understands that what modesty is is going to be applied in a multiplicity of, of communities and, and different norms for tire and for dress and, and every one of them is going to have to be tweaked just a little bit so that it fits the culture and the time. And so, and so I think that in light of that then, we all must understand the biblical principle and the doctrine, which is biblical, and then we must respect the application of that principle denominationally as the church leaders are interpreting that or applying that to, to their church. It's dangerous to look at the leadership and say, I, I see how you're applying it, but I'm not going to do what you're saying. Because it puts you in a position now where, where, where you're looking at leadership and say, I hear what you're saying, but I differ, and so I'm just going to do things my way. And that position spiritually is always risky because it is tending towards chaos. It is tending towards disorder. You have allowed yourself to take a position where you can just dismiss the teaching of the, of the leadership of the church and saying, I know better for myself. I'm just going to set that aside. That's a dangerous place to be spiritually. So to talk about convictions and to talk about standards, yeah, the, again, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the uh, doctrine or the principle is biblical. The application is, is, is not biblical. It varies. But that's what leadership is there for, to set a standard. And that's true. Whether it's the leadership of the church for a denomination or the leadership of a father for a family, everybody's going to set a standard somewhere if they're wise. If they're not, then hey, you know, you're going to really have trouble because children are too immature to make their own decisions and sometimes members are not mature enough to make the wisest decisions. Okay. Because I know for, I'll speak for myself personally, growing up, I remember the, the earliest instance where I cried because of a standard of our church was I couldn't go watch a movie. We we're going to go watch The Jungle Book. Yeah, that's, that's a, a terrible music movie to go watch. I'm, I'm glad your parents told you. No. So my mom, my mom like, she did the wise thing. She's like, we're going to wait for your dad. So I had my mm -hmm. hope up the entire day that I was going to be able to go. My dad Good comes dad. home. The and then my dad's like, well, what did your mom say? And my mom's like, well, we're waiting for you. He's like, well, you know we don't do that. So I didn't go watch The Jungle Book. But I'm, I'm speaking in terms of like progression what's been allowed within the assembly as I've been in the assembly. Yeah. That was a, like a hard no and I was only yeah. think, nine, nine years old in third yeah. grade. To now, more people or pastors or leader, you would say, are accepting of the fact or I guess willfully ignoring that fact and speaking to, um, they choose to apply the standard however they see fit for their congregation. Let me just say this, right? I'm Not to get you in trouble. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you permission to walk the jumble book at home, right? It's thank just, you. Get over that trauma. Yeah, but to, to finish, the, the thought would be, because the way we were raised with, if you're, disob if you're disagreeing or choosing willfully to disobey your authority, then now you're being disobedient. 
That's so, true. So it's not an issue, the way we were taught was, it's not an issue of salvation because yeah. it's not pertaining to doctrine. Like but now you're entering into disobedience because you're ignoring your authority. So my mom to That's this point, right. whether we don't wear, I always wanted a wedding ring. To this yeah. day, I still want a wedding yeah. ring. I don't have one, and I yeah, yeah. don't plan on getting one because I Good. choose to stay Good. in the assembly. So I think, I think that's right. Uh, Watchman Nee, that teaches a book that's called Spiritual, Spiritual Authority, if I'm not mistaken, is the name of his book, says that sins against authority are bigger than sins against moral sins. Mm -hmm. The greatest kind of a sin you can create, you can commit, is a sin against an authority figure. And the reason is because Romans 13 says that Every authority down here has been, has only has authority because it's been delegated to him by God. So the authority that a parent has over his children is God's authority. And the authority that church leaders have over church members is God's authority. And for you to look at your authority and say, I will not, or a child to look at his parent and say, I will not, is going against the very authority of God, which is the sin, according to his book, of Satan of Lucifer against God in the beginning that causes him to get cast out. And so the greatest sins with the greatest consequence are sins against authority. So I would say yes. I would say that, that that's why, you know, church leaders must be very wise about where we set the standards. We can't just set some kind of crazy standard, which in the past we may have done, but the past was a different time from today. So we look back and we say, only white shirts, black pants, only velos blancos for girls, and only black veils for married women. Okay, we look at that now back this week, because that's not our reality. We say, that's crazy. But we're not living back then, and we have no clue of the context back then. And what was appropriate then doesn't fit right now. And we can look back and say, okay, that's crazy, and criticize it, but it wasn't crazy for the moment. It might be crazy now, but then that's why we're not living that way now. Some churches don't have that standard now. But I think that, yes, whenever the church interprets a principle and then applies the principle, say, the wearing of the wedding band, we, we apply the principle. And, um, and then, and then um, a, a church member says, yeah, but I'm not going to do that. It's like a parent setting a standard. You're going to be home in this household by 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock on weekends. And the son can say, yeah, but I'm not going to do that. And as soon as he says, yeah, but I'm not going to do that to his authority, he's in sin. And he's not just in sin. He's in a sin against an authority. You take yourself out of the covering of God, God's authority. And that's a dangerous place to be. So would you, like my mom would, I would speak for myself, not put words, any pressure yeah. on you. So for me, when I wanted to get a ring or want to do things that yeah. were against our assembly's beliefs or standards, mm -hmm. she would say it's better that you leave the assembly and you can choose a denomination. She was still on oneness, so she was saying like UPC, say. UPCI, yeah. but ones that you're no longer being rebellious and or really like rebellious or being prideful that you want to do what we don't believe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say, um, I, I hear what your mother say, was saying and I, 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 I agree that if your position is, no, I'm going to do it, then get in a house where that's okay. Mm. But I don't think your mom was, yeah, she, was good she, with your saying, okay, then I'm leaving. Yeah, she yeah. would have fought you tooth and nail on that. I know your mother and your father. Righteously, she would have done that. You don't leave a home because you can't wear a wedding ring. You don't leave a house because we don't, we've got a standard against women wearing pants or guys wearing makeup or guys plucking their eyebrows or guys having long hair. You don't, you don't leave a house for those simple things. You leave house not because of the convictions things. That's light stuff. You leave a house because of doctrinal error. So do you believe it would be, it's incumbent upon the church to, because you were talking about setting high standards. Do you believe it will influence, or has it already influenced in your perspective or view, the lowering of certain standards to try to keep people from leaving yeah. because well, of... Well, let me say this. I, I, don't think that, I don't think the church needs to lower its standards because I don't think lowering standards keep people. Leadership keeps people. Mm -hmm. The moving of the presence of God keeps people. Giving the people something fresh to eat keeps people. You, you, you know, the idea that if we were to allow the wedding ring, our churches is going to grow. If we lower our holiness standards, our churches are going to grow is an illusion. And it's an illusion because... Um, 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 not talking about the mega churches that have sprang up in, in, in the Trinitarian denominational world 
And also, in, we have mega churches in the, in the apostolic world talking about the, the church. But the vast majority of churches that are non apostolic and that do not have our standards are less than 100 members. It's not like as soon as you drop everything, you, you shoot mega. No, it's very complicated to. To, let me refer back to the pastor that I was telling you that, you know, that is, is, was in our assembly, is no longer in our assembly, and lowered the standard. Okay, how many members does he have? He's maybe about 100, 120, right around the average. Maybe 150, right at the average. You don't grow exponentially because you drop the standard. You don't grow a church or, or take a church down because you have a standard. It's about the teaching, it's about the anointing, it's about leadership, it's about organization, it's about administration, it's about a myriad of things that build people up. And, um, and so we can't oversimplify this whole thing. And I, I totally reject the idea that if we were to lower the standard, the assembly would grow. Just absolutely, I think it's palpably false, the idea. Will we retain some people? Yes. But, um, but we won't gain anything. Should the church address current issues? And if they do address current issues, is it a responsibility of the leadership or the pastor to be able to educate their members enough to be able to articulate yeah. that? So what you're talking about is whether the church is going to be relevant or not, right? Correct. So we have, for example, not in too far distant past, we have Black Lives Matter. We had, uh, right now we have all those social issues that are going on about gender mm -hmm. uh, fluidity and identity and all those kinds of things. Should the church talk about homosexuality straightforward? Should the church talk about all of those big issues that are affecting mm -hmm. our culture? And the, uh, the, the answer is the church is the conscience of culture and society. And if the pastors and the churches don't speak up about all of these issues, then the conscience of the church has been quieted. And think about it. What is mass uh, 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 media, television, movies, and everything else? How do they make pastors look? They make them look like ignorant, fumbling, airhead kind of people that aren't intelligent, that aren't articulate, that don't have something to speak to. Why would you want to portray a, an individual that is speaking about morality and is trying to keep the, the nation morally on track? Why would you want to portray them as simpletons? The only reason for that is to quiet the voice of the preacher, to make a pastor feel ashamed to be a pastor, to make the congregation look down on the pastor and to have them think, well, yeah, you know, this is a guy, but he's not really that sharp or he really doesn't know that much. Hey, listen, the ministry, the church, is the conscience of the nation. It is the pulpits of America and of the United States and of our apostolic assembly and of Christendom that are supposed to be setting the moral standard for the entire nation. And is that happening today? To a great degree, no. That's why the nation is sliding further and further and further into this moral abyss that it finds itself in. The preachers must speak up. And I'm talking now for apostolic preachers, we must take all of these issues and find some way to educate our people about these things. You guys are all getting educated about that in school, in college, in university, hanging out with your friends. These are the conversations. You're constantly getting educated. And if the church is quiet, it's like a man with no conscience. What does he do? Not good. Take the conscience away from an individual and he becomes susceptible to every kind of moral lapse and sin that, that a man can possibly commit. Quiet the conscience of an individual, and he doesn't move towards righteousness. He slides towards iniquity. And so the question is, should the ministry be speaking about this? And the answer is absolutely yes. We set the standard. We remind people of where the righteous way is, and we encourage and exhort for them to walk in that way. Are there any tips that you would give? Because for me personally, like, did you homeschool your kids or did you send them yeah, to? Yeah, we did. We homeschooled our kids. That's where I'm leaning towards. My wife did, actually. As well. Yeah, we, we, we are right now in the Apostolic Assembly. Bishop uh, uh, Armando Tamez is doing a great job in, in revitalizing our uh, education within the Apostolic Assembly. We, are, we have commissioned him to uh, begin Christian schools in all of the districts of the assembly. We have nice. commissioned him to organize homeschooling for the apostolic assembly parents that are interested to create networks for that. 
he is creating a K through 12 manual of teaching for our kids. So when they get into it, they're going to go K through 12, all of the teachings so that children are being taught Bible knowledge and intermediates are being taught, you know, um, uh, Christian values. And they're getting into high school, junior high school, college are being taught how to defend the faith apologetics. Just a gradual progressive kind of teaching. It's still to come and it's new. So we're working through it. But yeah, we're, we're focused on saving our children. It's, it's too late once they're, once they're adolescents and they're, and they're older young people. But for a lot of them, it's too late if you didn't do your job early enough. And so you send your kids to Bible school, you homeschool them, Bible, Bible um, uh, to Christian schools, send them to Bible college and all that, and you are, you are strengthening their heart and their mind for ministry and for loving the Lord. And the Bible never gives us the right to surrender our children's education to a secular, anti-Christian society and culture, which is exactly where we're at right now. You send your kids to school, and they're going to teach them everything you believe is iniquity, as being right. It's a problem. God can chew a problem. I agree. It's something that I'm going, looking forward to. Yeah. Is Brother Tom, as you said? Yeah, Armando Thomas. He's doing Thomas. a wonderful job. He's our Secretary of Christian Education. Okay. My wife homeschooled our kids. We sent them to private Christian college when we could. And then when they went to secular college, it was the last two years of their, of their school. Mm -hmm. But their values are already set. They know that they're Christians. And, um, and, uh, and they know what we believe. And they grew up in that environment. And then the last two years of their, co of their high school was just so that they would get an accredited you know, regular kind of diploma, which is important for us too. And they did. They all graduated from, from a high school. You know, um, it wasn't Wilson High School, which is the best one in Long Beach, but it was another one. <laughs> awesome. Are there any tips you would give to parents? Like I'm a dad. I'm currently a, a dad girl. It's on the Lord whether I become a father Your dad or a son. Your dad or a girl? Girl dad. The two yeah. girls. Yeah, I'm girl dad. So I have two little daughters. Do you have any tips of raising daughters? that you would be willing to give to, to young fathers that are currently raising daughters? What's some yeah, just advice love them you would give? And show them what a man, what, what it really means to be a man by treating your wife the way she's supposed to be treated. That's the best lesson you can give your kids. Treat your wife well. Provide for your wife, protect your wife, be kind to your wife, be loving to your wife. Live that before, you, that's, that is something they'll never get in books. And they'll know what it really means to have a man love them, as opposed to having a guy that's, that's, that, that, uh, that is not attentive, that doesn't care, that's disconnected, that's not at home. And when he's at home, he's not at home. And, and, and then she'll go learning either one of two things. Either she'll yearn for the kind of love that every young lady wants to have, and she, knows, and she was innately created by God to desire. She'll yearn for that in other young men that'll give it to her temporarily, and there'll probably be a lot of hurt in those relationships, or she'll just kind of think that this is normal and lead her to a life that's going to be har harmful. Either way, she's not going to win. So the best way to, to, to manage that is just to love your wife in the eyes of your child. That would be my advice to you. So my advice to you for rearing a girl, girl in your life, it, girls in your life, is love on that woman that God gave to you. Be honest and integral man of integrity before her, you know. That'd be my best advice. And Focus it, on that, huh? Would it be the, the same advice that you would give to your son or that you modeled for your son? Yeah, I think that's true. I think you, before your son, you must be a man of integrity, a man of your word. I think you have to teach and direct and spend a lot of time with your boys. Hmm. Moving on to more lighthearted questions. <laughs> Do you have a favorite? I thought these were lighthearted. Sorry, Christian. <laughs> They're interesting questions. Do you have a favorite sports team? I'm not a sports guy. I've never been a sports guy. I will never be a sports guy. I tried when I was a young kid about you guys' age, mm -hmm. uh, rather younger, when I was 16, 17, 18, 19, around that time. I tried to become a Dodgers fan, and I tried to know some of the Dodgers' names, and I, I can't do that. I just, I just couldn't be a sports fan. You know, it... I like playing sports when I could. Now I can't, but I, when I could, I like playing sports. But I, it, my brain just doesn't work that way, you know. So when I was in high school, it was like 
too small to be on the football team, not tall enough to be on the basketball team, you know, not, you know, uh, so physically I was skinny then and I was five foot five on a good day, you know, so I'm not tall, I'm not bulky, I'm not none of that stuff. So when the coaches were going around in high school, the wrestling coach came and said, you know what, I think you'll do good in, in wrestling. And since wrestling was a weight kind of a thing, they go by, what's well, maybe I can do this. I said, okay, I'll do this. I was already baptized in Jesus' name. So when the coach came by, he said, look, you know, I'm going to try for wrestling. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at wrestling. But when I saw the uniform, I said, okay, I'm out. <laughs> the Holy Ghost just said, don't do it. And so I didn't do it I'm, for myself. I, just, I wasn't going to do that. So I was out. <coughs> and then I, I, I've never been a sports fan. I can't be a sports fan. I just like, I can't see myself, ah, Dodgers, ah, Dodgers, <laughs> or anybody else. I don't care about Dodgers. I know you're going to hate me, but 49ers, anybody else, Raiders, I don't like none of them. I don't care for them. I either, I'm either i not for them. I'm not against them. Let them do what they're going to do. It's just, hey, I'd rather sit down and watch a documentary on nature than to sit down and spend my time rooting for somebody that that's probably no good anyway because the majority <laughs> of sports fans are rooting for a losing team, so I'm not going to get into that. Uh I heard you recently picked up golfing. That you, that's the sport you got into recently. Yeah. How are yeah. you liking that? That's another one that I could probably do. But um, it's like everything else. I played a little bit of golf. And uh, I was, I, I guess the real problem with me in sports is this. I'm not willing to put the discipline into it to become really good. I'm just not. I'm going to be out there having fun. Sometimes I throw the golf club further than I hit the ball. <laughs> And that was it. You know, I just, I can't do sports. I'm not, I mean, I can, I'll go out there and play golf. I'm, I don't think I played golf like in two or three years. But one of these days, I'll go out there. Well, that's not true. I played golf with my son a couple of times. I'll play golf with my son, with Evan, my son-in-law, with Jonathan or one of the guys, you know, uh, maybe um, with, um, uh, with any of my son-in-laws. But I'm not going to play golf with anyone else because I want to be out there and have fun. I want to be able to tease them. I want them to be able to tease me and take it. I don't want to take golf seriously. I don't want to take any sport seriously. So I'm going to go out there. I'm going to play as best I can. And they're going to laugh at me and I'm going to laugh at them. And they're going to, you know, they're going to be that, 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 that fun thing. That's how a sports is supposed to be. Anything more serious than that, which is anybody else playing with it, I'm out. We I don't should, want to do that. We should go play golf together, Bishop. Yeah, that's just not going to happen. <laughs> On to the next question. <laughs> Do you have any hobbies then besides? I used to like, uh, I used to like, I like, I love scuba diving. I'm a scuba diver. Oh, wow. That's right. That was your job, Yeah, correct? that's Weren't absolutely you? great. I got certified in 1989, four years after I was married. I did it because I wanted to become a, I was a welder, and I wanted to become a, an underwater welder. They had a school there, they still have a school there in Wilmington for underwater welders. And so I figured, okay, maybe I'll do that and make some real money, you know, make really good money. And so... I went in, I took some diving classes. I always wanted to be a diver either way. I, it fascinates me. The ocean fascinates me. And so um, uh, I, I went to uh, take welding, uh, rather scuba diving classes. I was already a welder, and I learned how to scuba dive. And then I went to the school to see if I could enroll. And I found out that, that in order to become an underwater welder, you had to go where the work was. So I already had my wife, and I think it was one, one, one of our children, Kimberly, and they said, you're going to have to go to San Diego, you might have to go to New York, you might have to go to Hawaii, wherever the ports are, the work is, that's where you have to go. That was it. That was, I was done with that. That wasn't going to happen anymore. Family and ministry above work any day. Work is to provide for those two things. You don't sacrifice the really basic, fundamental, important things in life for money. Like they say, right? Not going to happen with me. And so I just, that was done. But I stayed with the, 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 the scuba diving, and I love scuba diving. I used to go scuba diving here off of um, Point Furman and went to Catalina a couple of times. I've been different places scuba diving. Mostly it was off here off Point Furman. It's one of the best things you can do. Is to, it's, like, it's like flying. The closest thing to flying It's fantastic. If you're in the right spot, it's, like, it's glorious. And uh, so that, I love that. Yeah, as far as a hobby. But I haven't done that for years now. You know, I think if the next time I'll do it, if I do it, it's going to be when I'm on vacation just because we're in, the, in that context, you know, where I can actually get out there and do some scuba diving. But mm -hmm. too busy right now to do that kind of stuff. I heard Hawaii is beautiful. The ocean terrifies me being underwater. And Does it? Yeah. 
Yeah. I'm not a strong swimmer. Are you a good? Oh, I was a great swimmer. He's a young man. <laughs> great swimmer. I'm not a strong swimmer. Yeah, yeah, I'm a strong swimmer. And I, yeah, no, no. The ocean is absolutely fantastic. It's scary. It can be scary, but it's like, phew, it's wonderful. Nothing like it. I'll take you one of these days. You have to get certified. How long, how, long, how long does it take to get certified? It took me about three months, maybe. It wasn't too long. But it's, it's great. It's fantastic. Do you, you have do any uh, favorite food? Mexican food. Oh, any? Mexican food? No specific dish? Mexican food. <laughs> do you have a favorite car? Well, my car. What car do you currently have? I, I, I'm driving a Lexus. Hmm. I just got a new car, you know, so I like my car. But I'm from my mom's, I, I, I'm, I'm like, I ha, I've embraced my mom's theology, theology, my mom's idea about this. And that is, I remember once driving in her car, it was a 1965 Nova. It had a blue paint job that was like at the stage where all of the, the, uh, the shiny mm -hmm. stuff is removed. And it's like, it, it wasn't wrecked up and stuff, but it was just not a good looking car. And um, I remember once being in the car with her and next to us came this bright, beautiful, shining car. And I said, Mom, look, Mom, mira el carro. Look at the car. That's a nice car. And she just didn't even turn on. She says, I like my car. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean you like your car? She goes, because that car, it doesn't take me nowhere. And this car takes me here and there and everywhere. <laughs> this one. So I'm, I, I embraced her idea at the time. So right now, my favorite car is my Lexus. Before that, it was my, my 2010 BMW. Before that, it was my Toyota truck. Before that, it was my whatever. So whatever God got, car God has provided for me, that's my favorite car. Hmm. Yeah. Do um, you have a favorite snack? Anything you like to snack on in particular? Or not much of a snack person? I had to think about that. Oreo cookies. Oreo, Oreo cookies. cookies. That's I love Oreo love cookies. Those too. That's a good one. My wife says I can't have any more, but uh, <laughs> I love Oreo cookies. Do you have a favorite kid? All of my kids. Oh, good answer, good answer. That's every parent. There's a, there's a story that's true that my favorite kid is the kid that is with me at the time. Because hmm. my daughters, they all ask, well, not all of them. Huh. One of them in particular asks me, Dad, who's your favorite? And I tell her, you're my favorite. So if Katie says, Dad, who's your favorite? I tell her, you are. If Kimberly tells me who's my favorite, I tell her, you are. If Jasmine were to ask me who's my favorite, I will tell her, you are. If my son were to ask me who's my favorite, I'll tell him, you are. They're all, when they're right next to me, I tell them, you're my favorite. When they're all there, I say, I have no favorites. <laughs> it's got to be wise about that, you know. Smart man. I, I think that this whole favorites thing has to do not so much with the parent having a favorite, but it has to do with how a child interacts with the parent. Mm. So that in our family, Katie, Kimberly is more reserved. Philip is somewhere in between, but he's the boy. Jasmine is really to herself, kind of. And Katie is the glue. She's like, wherever dad is, zoom, she runs to her dad. She's looking for hugs. She's looking for kisses. She's, she's looking to be around me. And so everybody looks at that and say, okay, she obviously knows. Katie's the favorite. She, but, and, and she is if we're face to face. But, but uh, for all of my children, is she my favorite? I have no favorites. But she gets most of the attention because she seeks most of the attention. Has there been a difference between being a father and now being a grandfather? Yeah, that's better than being a grandfather because <laughs> the children get to go back with their parents after you spoil them. <laughs> and then uh, wrapping up, how was your, this was your first convention, correct? Uh, yeah. Was how, what did you think? You mean the first convention that I that oh, we, saying, under yeah. my administration? Correct. It was a great convention. Going I back thought it was to fantastic. Anaheim. There are a lot of positive comments. Um, I think the spirit of the whole convention was beautiful. The presence of the Lord was there. Uh, the ministerial side of this whole thing, our legis even our legislative flowed very smoothly. We got all of our work done. Our conferences were dynamic. The speakers are relevant. I thought it was a great convention. And not because I was at the head of it. I think that all of our conventions have been good. But, you know, I thought it was a really good convention. I agree. Yeah. What do you look forward to for next year? It's a general convention. Do you think we're going to do the same uh, setup for the arena? What was your viewpoint of the 360 experience? The only thing I didn't like about it, and I'll start there, is that when I stood up, and I didn't realize this until I got up to the platform, when I stood up to... To, uh, to take the platform. The platform was looking at a little, at an exit with just a few people around it 
and the mass of people was everywhere else. Mm. That kind of took me a little bit by surprise because you have this whole convention center filled with people looking at you and you're looking at this void and then people around it like this. It was a small section of the people that were in that auditorium. And so in a certain, in that respect, I like better having the, the, traditional. the traditional where you're looking at the mass of people mm -hmm. as opposed to looking at this little section. But, um, so I'm not sure exactly how we're going to do that. We did that because we wanted to fit as many people into the convention center as possible. Yeah. And we'll probably do the same thing next year or this year rather at the end of this convention center. But I do want to say this, that if this is going to be the first convention, I think, that we're going to do exclusive, not exclusive, we're going to do strictly English and Spanish. No bilingual. We're going to have English convention and we're going to have Spanish convention. And um, that's going to be something new that we're going to do. But we're doing it because for decades now, the church has been in need of focusing on our English-speaking community in the Apostolic mm -hmm. Assembly and not having them go off to other oneness denominations or or worst case scenario, going off to Trinitarian denominations because they're not, they're not, they're not um, uh, being ministered to here in their culture and in their language. And so the time has come to totally put focus on the Spanish. They've got all the attention they will always have that they need, but to totally put our focus on the English speaking community and say, we're not just gonna give you at the very best bilingual services, we're gonna give you we're going to organize around your being a church that is, has every need met in your culture and your context. So it'd be one English service on its own and then one Spanish? Yes, yeah, so I think what we're going to do, at least we're thinking that now, that we're going to have, for example, let's say at 5 o'clock we're going to have just the English service and then at 7 o'clock we'll have just the Spanish service and then we'll do that. We're going to have a whole convention uh, center that's going to be just English conferences for and everything mirrored on this side. There's going to be everything same thing in Spanish and um, Yeah, it's time to send the message and I want to send this to the entire church And that is that it, for our English-speaking community. This is really important to us We are going to minister to you According to your language and your culture and it's big big for me to get pastors and young preachers and pastors to say, I'm going to plant a church for the Apostolic Assembly, but this is going to be an English church. Huge. Let's get it done. I think it's important. Awesome. I like that. Sounds good. The English for sure is my especially favorite. For me, favorite yeah. like, especially for me. Yeah, I don't want to be losing any more of our young kids. I'm concerned not about the church. My generation, we serve the Lord, and we've done what we could. we still got a little bit more to do, not that much more. We're going to turn this over to younger ministers and to people that are going to lead the church on to the next, over the next couple of decades, if Christ comes which I'm expecting should happen soon. And, um, and I don't, I'm not just concerned about my wife right now, I'm concerned about my children that mostly speak Spanish, and I'm concerned about my grandchildren that are probably not gonna, I, did I say Spanish? Mm -hmm. I'm concerned about my children that speak, mostly speak English, and I'm concerned about my grandchildren that are probably gonna speak nothing of Spanish. Mm -hmm. And so, and so yeah, I have to set things up in order now, like we've done here in Rosanna. I have to set things in order now so that whatever English-speaking people that come to this church, they say, hey, I belong, I fit here. I don't have to struggle over this and the other to fit. I fit. That, that's a goal for me. So we like to close our, our podcast with a segment called Mount Rushmore, which is where we give <clears throat> like our top four uh, things in that subject. And this time the question is, if you have, uh, who are your top four favorite preachers that you like to listen to? Well, I'm not, I don't listen to preachings very much. Um, I, 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 my formative years as a young man, Mark Hamby, huge. He was the number one. Kenneth Phillips was huge, también. And then uh, in the, uh, in the, um, in the apostolic assembly, I think that, um, let me think, who would be my favorite preachers? Hmm. I guess the, the reason that I'm struggling with that a little bit is, and I suppose I could name some guys here, but to say that they're my favorite preachers, eh. This answer will be trending, <laughs> whoever you say in the assembly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have yeah. a lot of pride. Yeah, I, I just, I don't have favorite preachers. I, 
that goes your trail, no right? <laughs> I don't have favorite preachers. I'm not, if you're asking me, I want to <laughs> learn. So, I mean, Valverde, Brother Sam Valverde was certainly one of the premier preachers of our church. Um, he would be one of them. But if I, I you, you were to say, we have a teaching conference and a preaching conference, where are you going to go? I'll Same choose way. teaching 100% of the time. I'm not, I don't feel like I need to be motivated. I don't feel like I need to be energized. I don't feel like I need to, okay, come on, Pastor, you can keep going. Okay, I'm going to keep going with you, encourage <laughs> me or not. I'm just going to keep moving forward. It's just the way that I think about it. So I'd rather use, I'd rather grow knowledge. I'd rather for you teach me something that I can take to the local church or, or that I can apply in my personal life or that I can apply my, I'd rather learn something than to have someone say, eh, you can make it. Okay, I'm, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. You know, Jesus is going to help me. And that's a little funny way that I have free of, of thinking. So, so most of my favorite teachers are going to be pe- teacher, are going to be preacher teachers. They're going to have to teach me something in order for me to say, wow, I love listening to this guy. And um, as a young man, again, when I was a young fella, Mark Hamby, Kenneth Phillips, um, T.F. Tenney, all those United Pentecostal Church were amazing, amazing preachers. And uh, in our assembly, of course, Brother Sam Valverde and another man that, of his category that have, that have really, you know, set a high standard for the rest of us, you know, for when I grow up, this is the kind of preacher that I want to be like. And so we got a lot of great preachers in the church right now. I, I don't want to start naming them all because I'm going to miss some, but we have a lot of great young preachers that are going up, coming up now. But, you know, I'm not looking at them saying, man, I sure wish I was like them. Um, that's not true. Um, outside of the assembly, I wouldn't even name anybody. I've got some people that I listen to, but I won't name. <laughs> I'm apostolic straight up through and through. Awesome. Yeah. You want to do yours? Oh, my top four? Um... I like list. I'm, I think I'm on a similar mindset of teaching versus preaching. I remember one of the preachings you did, and the first, very first upper room was impartation was the the title. I don't yeah. know if you remember, but that one stuck with me to this day. And then something that you've said to me, you're one of my favorite teach because I think you fall into that category that you teach a lot yeah. when you preach. You preach, and something that you that I stuck with me, and I always say it to everybody when they ask me where I stand on certain things with issues with doctrine and uh, convictions was never, you told me, it was at a funeral for my family, and I was talking to you afterwards, and you said, well, I'll never compromise oneness, the power and the belief in the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues, and that was the three that you talked about. The yeah. power of the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, being baptized in Jesus' name, and then oneness. Yeah. Like, you have those three things, like everything else I'm willing to work with, but those three things I'll never compromise yeah. with. And Core that's doctrine. something that has stuck with me that I teach still to my young people that I tell them, like, as long as the Holy Ghost, the name of Jesus Christ, and oneness, we can work and teach you everything else. But those three things are uncomparable and that have to be core tenets. No matter what you Always. might teach or believe, those three things. Well, that's what makes you apostolic, right? Correct. Mm-hmm. Got the United Pentecostal Church, got the Apostolic Assembly, got the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, those three wonderful denominations. They're all apostolic. What makes them apostolic? And, and, and it's in, uh, what makes them apostolic in light of their stark differences? Is that's what everybody must hold on to. Jesus name baptism, the oneness of God, and filling baptism with the Holy Spirit, that you must live a holy life. Those are core tenets. Who is Jesus Christ? Obviously, those core tenets um, uh, that you cannot compromise. Yes, I would say. It's what makes you apostolic. I would say you would be one. Um, I always like the uh, bishop, or I don't know what their titles are, but Brother David Bernard. I listen to a lot of his stuff on YouTube and debates. And one of my favorite preachers, now we're thinking about it, is, is Bishop Misael Gorola. He's fantastic. Mm. Oh, he's good. He is I heard great. I heard them at their pastor. Pastor's Day. Teacher, yeah. yeah. Wonderful, man. I like hearing him preach. He's going to be here this Sunday if you want to come. <laughs> my parents <laughs> told me. That's what we were told. Here. They told us to get him on the podcast on Sunday. <laughs> But brother, uh, brother David Bernard, I really like. Uh, I've heard uh, Brother Jeff Arnold, and then I think of the current young preachers. I've heard Brother Garza only on Zoom oh. during their church, but your son-in-law, I really enjoy. He's a good preacher. I really like. Oh, I've uh, taught him well. <laughs> I really like uh, Pastor it's Jonathan Garza. And then I also really enjoy uh, hearing uh, Pastor Cortez, Omar Cortez. We got a lot of great up-and-coming preachers. Mm-hmm. 
the, 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 the future of the apostolic assembly is bright. And there's a lot of other young men that are coming up. Some that you haven't mentioned that are really good preachers. A great preacher right now is Jonathan Cruz. Cruz. That kid is anointed. He's fantastic. Daniel Martinez, he's a pastor also. He's a wonderful preacher. We've got a bunch of kids. Um, 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 Brother Rodriguez, City Light Church. You know, I'm, I mean, we're talking about kids that are up and coming that are like, they're going to lead powerful churches. Frank Casada, you know, he's growing mm -hmm. that church over there. Jonathan, like all of those guys. I mean, we have a bunch of preachers that are just, it's, it, when I have to step out of ministry, it's going to be good to see these guys coming up behind us. And, and they've, got the, they've got the passion. They've got the commitment. They're apostolic. They're anointed. It's, it, we can live in peace, you know. It's when you got a bunch of kids coming up for you that are, that, that are wanting to totally throw everything out and start everything new that would concern us, but that's not what's coming up behind us. We have, we have, we have a bunch of young preachers that are totally apostolic and are wanting to be relevant, and that excites me. Well, there awesome. Are so for me, uh, one of mine would be Pastor Anthony Romo. Uh, he's, he's an awesome, awesome. preacher. Uh, Pastor Omar Cortez. Uh, my pastor, Pastor Alex Aguila. See, you, you guys are saying all that because you guys are young. Yeah. I'm an old guy. Yeah. I, have to, I have to look at these, these, these guys that have been in the church for a long time. <laughs> you guys are thinking all the contemporary guys. You guys got a bunch of fantastic preachers. And then I definitely put you on my list too, Bishop. You're on all my right, list. there you go. You got one old guy. <laughs> I got the one. And for yeah. me, do you have any retirement age? Do you want to make a, an announcement exclusive to our Off Limits podcast, a retirement year? That you have in mind? Yeah, later. that's off limits. You're gonna, <laughs> set, I'm kidding. You're gonna set off into the sunset. I'll be pre I'll be retiring in from the pastorate maybe in three years. Mm, wow. 67, 67 years old, and um, actually I'm I, uh, totally retiring from uh, from from uh, any pastoral position or anything like that. I'm projecting three years. I will officially be retiring from as pastor of Hosanna Apostolic Church in around June of this year. Of this year? Mm hmm Oh, wow. Oh. And I'm going to dedicate myself to being the president of the Apostolic Assembly. Does that mean you're going to decline presidency? Can you still be president in three years if you're no longer a pastor? I suppose so. And if I can't, well, then it is what it is. I think constitutionally I can. Okay. But, uh, you know, oh, yeah, you can, I'm, you I'm not going to cry you over can. that stuff, you know. I, I, I feel totally privileged to serve the church that the Lord has allowed me to serve the church at this capacity. And if that's only for four years, I'm going to give God praise. And if it's for eight years, I'll give God praise. And um, I'm ready for whatever comes. What do you have planned for your retirement, your post-active ministerial years? Anything? Yeah, I'm going to... Scuba dive? Um, no, no, no. You don't retire from the ministry. You never retire from but the ministry. But active, like being the front and so center point what person. I, what, I, what I expect is that when I come to church on Sundays, that it's going to be another young fellow that's going to be worrying about who came, who didn't come, how the service went, how the preacher preached, how the praise team sang, how the administration went. That's no longer on my desk. We're going to move that over to a younger, more intelligent, more energetic individual. And he's going to have to worry about that. I can just come and enjoy and minister and serve. That's, a, that's going to be a huge advantage for me. But before I retire, I'm going to sit down with who's going to be my pastor, and I'm going to say, what's my job before he's the pastor? And I say, what do you mean? Well, what's my job here when you become the pastor? And he's going to have to tell me, well, you're going to do this, this, and this. Okay, here's the church. Uh, I'm not going to come to church and do nothing. Uh, that would be the death of me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to set all that up so that I have, I, I don't need an office, but so at least they say, okay, you come and you, you help us organize the administration or you help us uh, lead the cell group leaders or you help us to do this or the other, whatever. I'll, just give me something to do where I'm going to be teaching, where I'm going to be exercising the gifts that I have. I'll do that till the day that I'm either can't think anymore square or that, uh, or that the Lord comes to take me or I'm just too old to do it. Awesome. Any last words you want to give before we sign off? Hasta luego. Hasta luego. <laughs> Thank y'all for joining us. Stay tuned. We thank you, Bishop, for taking this time out. Thank you, Bishop President. All right, guys. God bless you. It's great having a conversation with you.